Welcome back to Old Guy REI. Mikey and I are here again, going to go over the highlights from our last accountability Zoom call, which was for November 6th of 2024. And uh, Mikey, we have a few of these on the school platform these days. Did you say this was number 19? Number 19, runtime right at three hours. Yeah, we we just seem to keep hitting that spot. I know there have been a couple of weeks where we thought it was going to end early, but then somebody will pop in with a question. And we like to get people's questions in the beginning of the meeting to make sure they get answered. Uh, I guess some people might be just a little bit shy. Hopefully they're not intimidated because that's why we're all there to, to be able to learn and get suggestions from other investors. And we've said before, like you and uh, Cynthia and I are kind of in the same position. We're still fairly new, but a lot of the other people that come into the meeting have a, a lot more experience and do different types of investing. So we're hoping that it's helpful. And I think this week specifically, there was one person that uh, lives in San Francisco that's looking to purchase a property in San Diego that they could build an ADU on. And one of the other members that night happens to live in San Diego and offered to do videos or property walkthroughs with them. And and the the San Diego resident is a contractor as well. So they have a pretty good idea of what they're looking at. I thought that kind of connection is just what we're going for on these meetings. And it's amazing. His his channel, you know, he's going He's he's actually went to Gary, Indiana. I know he has an investment property out there and he's doing work, fixing things up. But in those videos, he's teaching you kind of LVP and electrical and all the things he's seeing. So it's great having, you know, two contractors like you and and him just kind of going through the ropes, teaching different techniques or different phrases of how you look at things. So it's, it's great to learn and understand. Yeah, I think he's open to people reaching out with questions. We'll have to get his permission later on and we can talk about his channel and stuff more, give his email out. You know, um, we always offer that ourselves with anybody that has questions or um, if they don't want to talk during the meeting, you know, they can email me at oldguyrei at gmail.com. And I'm always happy to help that in that way. Um, that that was one of the highlights of the meeting. In the beginning of the meeting, we had actually had someone new joining from Baltimore. Um, now there's a couple of people in that market. Hopefully, they'll be able to connect as well. One of um, our other friends that comes on weekly had asked the group about recommendations on what he should put in his new lease. He's He's moving out of a unit that he's going to rent, and this will be his first lease. Some of the things that came up that we've talked about in the past also were things like I asked him if he was going to accept pets because people have certain limitations. Some people don't like pets at all. Some will accept any pet. Um, and I think you mentioned someone that had a specific size on on types of dogs and things that they permit in their units. That was really interesting to hear because she wanted 20 pound dogs and under. And if in their lease, they had a stipulation where it said if an animal, you know, and they weren't told that an animal is, is in the property, then they will charge per day for that. Yeah, that would, that would be important to put the, in the lease before anybody moved in. And, also, like we've talked in the past, there are certain breeds that insurance companies won't cover. So that would be some good information to have for the landlord before they accept pets or if someone brings a pet to their attention. You know, pit bulls always get a bad rap, but that's one of the first ones that comes to mind that our insurance company wouldn't insure. And and I had reached out. I, I have insurance with Traveler, so I'd reached out to my insurance broker and then he had given me a boilerplate response of all the different breeds that was not allowed. 
Yeah, good information. I had to ask one of the one of the members last week had talked about leases and the fact that he had offered a 12 month lease and an 18 month lease. And he had given an incentive for people who signed an 18 month lease. And he reminded me that the difference there was he was giving $100 off the rent if you signed an 18 month lease. And with things going the way they are these days, I know um, we were just talking recently about rent softening and things like that. And with winter coming, you know, you have uh, you have a vacant unit. We have three vacant units in different markets, but our property managers are coming back with lower rental comps than we originally thought, you know, when we were analyzing deals, we had a certain rent in mind because that's what it was at the time. And now that a couple of months has passed with winter approaching and things like that, we might not get the rents that we were hoping for. Do you have any thoughts on accepting a lower rent than you originally planned on yeah this is something i'm dealing with and we were talking about it it's that's why it's so important that you know when they say all the rei avengers talk about you make money on the buy it's so true because especially how frank how you run your numbers it's like there's a lot of room in those numbers to play with so in case there's instances like this you know, even if it is a little bit softened, it still works for you. Yeah, at least you'll have a little bit of cash flow. Uh, so ideally, we would shoot for at least $200 positive cash flow a month. And, you know, if we're counting on a $1,200 a month rent to make those numbers, and you end up getting $1,100, let us say, then you are only positive 100 but you're still positive after all expenses are paid and you're setting aside uh, we set aside 15 percent for reserve so um as long as it doesn't turn into an alligator i think we'll still be fine through this and we've even talked about the fact that we might end up having to hold the units through winter if there's not much action during especially the holiday uh, thanksgiving and christmas i'm i'm prepared for that as well and it, it just it's another awakening moment for me where it's like reserves how important they are and crucial they are so we've talked about you know kind of looking at those numbers and seeing if we should jump that up or maybe manage those a little bit better yeah and there are different reasons for the extension in um, vacancy because one of the other people in the group mentioned that his rehab took three months longer than he had anticipated so that put him right in the winter months but I think he was fortunate he got that unit filled and um, he got at least got the minimum rents he was hoping for. Um, but he also had just bought that place and turned out that his appraisal came back way higher than he was even hoping for. So that enabled him to actually do a successful burr and pull all his cash back out. And like you mentioned earlier, he, he was getting an infinite return now because of because of the fact that he was able to do that. Yeah, congrats. That's so awesome to hear. Yeah, he's he's been doing some good things. I think he also mentioned the fact that he he had a lead for a potential seller financing deal in his same market. So he was going to be checking on that this week and give us the details next week. And I like that there was another investor who's done multiple seller finance deals that had mentioned the Brett Whistle calculator. And that can be found at B-R-E-T-W-H-I-S-S-E-L.net. So Brett Whistle.net calculator. And then yeah. he's he's shown instances where he's printed out kind of what the amortization schedule is for a seller finance deal, given it to the seller. And they've kind of talked over, okay, this is what we're looking at. Do you have any counters or is there anything else you wanted to see? And that's worked out really well for him. Yeah, that was great advice. And they also talked about the fact that because um, the initial investor was asking what the most challenging part of a seller finance deal was. And 
they had said it helps a lot if the seller is familiar with seller financing because when when we've heard it explained to us it almost sounds a little bit shady so if you don't have experience you're going to think somebody's trying to you know bring you a bad deal or um, pull the property out from under your nose somehow but if they have knowledge then you guys can work together and a lot of the people in the group like to keep agents out of it because agents don't always understand it themselves and they might talk a seller out of doing a deal with someone. Yeah, there's a reason why seller financing is like the golden, it's like the golden goose of transactions. Yeah, people can get really great favorable terms and it, and it can work for both the seller and the buyer. It doesn't have to be one-sided. Some of the, a couple of the guys that joined us that night had come from another meeting with um, a presentation from Bright Investor. Do you use any services like that? Do you subscribe to any? I did try the free version of Coffee Closers. So for Bright Investor, we've had the Natawan, your economy meetings, and that was a great presentation. For them, they do $65 a month for three states. You get 30 reports a month, or they have an $82 a month nationwide and unlimited reports. And then we've also had Coffee Closers, Ariel, do a presentation as well. Hers is $83 a month for the basic version and $119 a month for traditional plus creative. So it's, it's good to see the different type of software that's out there to try to source more deals and evaluate more deals. Yeah, and to analyze properties in any given market. Um, one of the members said that he likes coffee closers a little bit more because it seems more user-friendly. Um, Bright Investor has a ton of information to sort through, so it seems like it would take <clears throat> a little bit longer to understand how to use it to your advantage. But also, I think um, they had offered like a phone call to help you um, to help walk you through the process and understand all the switches and buttons involved in um, getting all the information out of it. And they, they constantly have free webinars covering various topics. So if you're interested, you could always reach out. You know, we, we have good relationships with both of them. So yeah, just give it a try. See if you like it or not. Yeah. It, either one seemed really, really um packed full of information that would be helpful for investors looking for their first property or analyzing neighbor, even down to the neighborhoods, you know, how many owners versus renters are in a specific area, things like that. That was really helpful. Um, one of the other topics that came up was um, evictions because, you know, we, Cynthia and I went through two evictions recently and those are working out fairly well, I guess, as far as evictions go, the units are turned, we're getting t new tenants in place this month. So that one worked out well. One of the one of the attendees was talking about how difficult Michigan was <clears throat> as far as evictions. I think he said he paid $2,000 for the eviction and then he needed to do a trash out on the property to remove all the stuff the tenant left behind. And he couldn't hire his own trash out company. It had to be someone appointed through the court system and that was a five thousand dollars by itself so you know he was talking seven thousand dollars for an eviction i think the ones we did in milwaukee were about seven hundred dollars total so those things are kind of market specific i guess depending on where you're investing so it's good to maybe know that information before you buy in a certain market The um, And there were a couple of members also that just bought properties in Detroit, uh, for example, and, you know, talking about rent softening and things like that. Their unit's been vacant for a little while, and they ended up lowering the rent recently to see if that gained uh, any interest in, in the property. 
actually lowered it by quite a bit. I think about $150 this time. So hopefully he'll get some some action on that and get it rented. But again, you know, we talked about reserves earlier and and thankfully he has plenty of reserves because if he has to, you know, carry it for another couple more months and pay that mortgage, um, the reserves are going to come in handy. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad he has reserves. Yeah, that's for someone that has spent so much time researching and studying real estate investing. I'm glad that that's one of the, the cornerstones he has to move forward. Yeah, and he had also asked about um, people's different um, qualifications that they ask for when they're uh, looking at potential tenants. And I asked our people in Milwaukee, our property manager in Milwaukee, and they had mentioned that the credit score was only 550, which I was surprised at. That. And they, um, so that was the minimum credit score. They also don't want to see any evictions and they go for two times the rental income. And they were saying they go a little bit further and make sure that the applicants don't have any violent crimes on their police record. And that's something I hadn't heard before. And also, um, well, the tenants that they have ready for us, one was in the high sixes and one was in the low sevens. So the the minimum didn't really bother me too much because they're still looking for higher scores. It's just, I guess it gets them more traffic that way and they can sift through them after the fact. But we also talked about minimum credit scores kind of being area specific. I think you had talked to... Um, or you had been in a conversation about Gary specifically and what their minimum credit scores are, because one of the investors there also has properties in Washington state and the credit scores vary a lot because of the two, two different, um, I don't know what you'd call it. I guess the, the people in each state, um, the, the jobs and, availability job availability and things like that has an impact on what people can do yeah i remember hearing just if they were to have a good credit score they could just potentially just buy a house with the cost of housing over there so yeah, it's interesting how the different markets have these little nuances to all yeah and it was actually the investor's property manager that that educated them on why they were okay with a lower credit score in Gary versus what he was seeing in Washington. Uh, we also had a great conversation that night about painting. A couple of the of the guys in the group uh, do quite a bit of painting and were giving us some good tips on how they like to do it. And um, that was some great information. And I didn't know that painting is one of your favorite things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I really like it. And I guess over the years, um, I don't know, I really relax when I paint. All the people that have worked with me over the years, it stresses them out and I don't understand it. But um, I guess it's because, and two of the guys were talking about whether they use blue tape to, you know, to cut in trim and stuff like that. I don't use tape. Um, and we talked about the fact that blue painter's tape is so expensive these days, you know, I can't see and, and if you just use a brush for a little while, you can get it to where you can you can cut a nice straight line, uh, no matter what you're painting. But um, I thought that was interesting how you talked about blue tape, but then also the frog tape, the green. I, I never heard of this before. And in terms of how the paint can run on the walls between the two. Yeah, actually. So I think with any tape, if you don't press your edge down nice and firm against whatever you're masking off, the paint can get behind the tape a little bit and, and bleed. So it doesn't do you any good to mask off if you're going to let that happen anyway. So the blue tape is very good at stopping that from happening, but the frog tape is even better. I, I don't use frog tape because it's even more expensive than the blue tape. Um, you know, when we do use tape, I, I told you before the 
uh, my cousin works with me and he masks everything off because he's just a little bit sloppier. But, um, you know, and like I said, it, it relaxes me, but it stresses him out. So he's all nervous about painting. He's not going to cut a straight line to save his life. Uh, that was a great conversation. Um, and, and out of nowhere, I got some great advice for myself because I had talked about, you know, um, being older, being a contractor for all these years and not being able to do a lot of the more physical work that I used to do in the past and trying to find a way to kind of transition out of it. And you and I have spoken because I do have one person that had offered me a almost like a project manager position. And some of the other people in the group had, had mentioned even reaching further out to other contractors or property management companies or even real estate agents to kind of be a, a project manager for some of them. So that was really nice and, and helpful for me to, to think about for the years coming up. Again, yeah, and that was fascinating about the paint as well, like all the different types of techniques, like with wet rags or with the angle brushes. I, I enjoyed listening to that. And then there's also talking about the the weenie rollers. Yeah, that was yeah, kind of they, <clears throat> yeah, they brought up a lot of cool things. Uh, over the years, we've, you know, like, um, for example, if you're painting baseboards and you have hardwood floors or something, we won't always mask those off. Uh, we'll cut them in by hand. And if you if you take a, a T-shirt works best because it's pretty smooth instead of a, a regular terry cloth towel. But we'll take a, a taping knife and we'll wrap a wet rag around the blade. And then if you do hit the floor at all, then you just take that rag and the blade and just clean it right along the baseline. And it comes right, right off. Uh, little things like that. They also have a tool called a Sureline, which is, it's a little square painting pad, but it has wheels on it and it's made to cut a line. So I'll even use those when I'm cutting the edge of a window trim or a door trim, I'll take that sure line and you just run, run it right up the side of the trim and the wheels roll on the wall. But oh. it, the hairs are so fine that it just leaves a nice cut in line right in the corner. <clears throat> and then after that's done, cause that takes the most time for me, then you just paint the face of the trim and everything else with your brush. It makes it a lot faster and, and you can use it on, you know, just say, for example, most of the time we paint the ceilings white and then we'll paint a color on the walls. You can use those too. And you just, you hold, you hold the pad and you just load it up a little bit with your brush, not putting too much paint on it because it will spread out too much sometimes. But then you just take that and run it along the ceiling and it cuts your line right in. And then from there you use your roller and, and paint the rest of the wall. Yeah. And you, Speaking of one rental at a time school community, twenty dollars a month. You had a good post on there about different paints that people use, what they'd like. So we know the different Sherwin Williams, and you you have talked about Bear B E H R, but then it was kind of cool because they were also mentioning Pittsburgh Ultra, and also Amazon Paint, the recycled paint. So that was interesting and and Dunn Edwards. So that was kind of good to hear all the different types of ranges and people are still finding uses of paint. That recycled paint, the Amazon paint was especially surprising because they were saying, what, $18 per gallon that they can use. So that was kind of yeah. cool. That's a really good price. I think um, with recycled paints, a lot of times you can only get like one or two colors because they just take all the paints and mix them together. And whatever they come up with, that that's what they sell. <clears throat> we have like when we go to the dump, there's a a hazardous waste where people take all their old chemicals and paints and things, and they will recycle the paint. So you can get gray paint from them all the time. And it's um, I don't recall what they charge or if they even charge, but um, I thought that was a great tip. I hadn't seen it up for sale on Amazon, but I'll be checking that out too. And probably the most expensive paint that we buy is made by Benjamin Moore. It's a really good product, but you can see, you know, easily 60 or $70 a gallon for something like that. If a, if a customer asks us to use that, we'll just, 
we'll give them a price for labor and then they pay for the paint. And I, I've had good luck with the bare paint from Home Depot. Some people have mentioned they don't like to go there because they have to wait a long time to get the paint, but I'm always there as soon as they open. So I'm in and out pretty quick. Um, Sherwin Williams is a good, a good brand. And we, we did use Dun and Edwards when we first started out, but they're kind of area specific too. They're not, over here where we live, we have to drive about an hour to their nearest store. But, um, and, and two, Bear has different grades. We typically use the middle grade, not the, not the contractor grade. The contractor grades in any paint are, are like the bare minimum. Um, sometimes the coverage is not that great. I usually do two coats anyway, because I don't think you get the true color of a paint with one coat especially depending on what you're painting over. Sometimes that tint from the old color can kind of come through and it messes up what you're shooting for. So if you let that dry real well and then give it a second coat, that's always works out best. Yeah, that was a funny conversation when they're talking about covering up, painting over yellow walls and purple walls. And yeah, that was funny. Yeah, there are certain colors that are hard. Red is real hard, for example. It it seems like you have to give several coats per red to actually work. But one thing we've done in the past is actually painted the walls black first. And then when you go over it with the red, it's a lot easier and you'll only have to do two coats. We've had some customers, you know, we've done, you know, before we knew any better, we've done four or five, six coats of red and it still looks like transparent. So we just ended up painting the walls black. I don't know how I got that idea, but we did it and then we painted the red over it and it covered real well. Red walls. The customer wanted that. Yeah, there's a color. <laughs> we used to hate it. It was a Kelly Moore color called Bougainvillea. It was a very pretty color, but it seemed like you could just never get it. Or when you're cutting in, you would see the what they call picture framing, right? If you paint around a window trim, and then you roll it, you would see the brush marks around the window trim, no matter how many coats you put. But um, again, we paint it black and then we just do our standard two coats and we didn't have any issues. Yeah, and I know, I know Matt specifically, he likes the Benjamin Moore, the Regal Select paints. Yeah, that is a good paint. But again, it's a little pricey. Uh, well, and two, he gets a good discount because he buys so much of it at once and they always use the same color. So that would be a benefit too for bigger landlords if they buy it in bulk and then they'll save some money that way. But two, you could save money. Um, you can open an account. You don't have to be a contractor. You can open an account at just about any store and get contractor pricing. Somebody mentioned that, I think it's at Sherwin-Williams, that if you mention that you're a landlord, they will give you, and you can open an account, they'll give you wholesale prices. Yeah, I have in my notes that a landlord set up a business account, then that's 30, 35 percent off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they just mark it way up for the regular public. So um, if you're going to pay those prices, it's not. It doesn't really work out well as far as bidding jobs and things. So you need to to get as much of a discount as possible when you're buying the stuff. And as always, old guy REI trying to bring as much value as he can. I, I know you have that Amazon link. I wonder, possibly maybe you could post that. If anyone ever has the Amazon purchase in the future, you can use that link, buy whatever you want. Then he'll get a couple of cents, maybe a couple of dimes, but it helps out the channel. It'll help out paying for the Zoom account link that you pay for annually. So yeah, check that out if you guys ever have Amazon purchase in the future, especially with holiday season coming up. Yeah, that's a great reminder. Thanks for bringing that up. And and actually, um, that was your thought too, because we we just bought the the Zoom annual subscription so we could host the weekly accountability calls. And um, I think I never really thought about it, but yeah, if people use the link, it doesn't cost them any more, right? They do their shopping and and it um, helps a little bit with paying for that subscription each year that would be great yeah yeah thank you sure. so we'll look forward to doing this again after next wednesday's meeting 
definitely looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for being with us. All right. See you.